It's great to be here at the um, heart of uh, business capital of the world and Pace University, thanks also to MIT Enterprise Forum. Um, and I know there are fantastic um, business plans I was reading on my way here. Uh, so really impressive. Uh, I don't know whether I would have uh, made it in through this contest. And I know there are astute uh, judges here. So I'll be very quick. And I, I mean, I know uh, three minutes can be $25,000. So I will be uh, careful with my minutes. Thank you. Um, I just uh, wanted to introduce you also the Legatum Center, uh, which is founded uh, two years ago uh, at MIT because MIT is a good place for all sorts of innovations, and um, it, some of those innovations could be um, good lead to good enterprises in, in developing countries. And because that's based on a pretty sound economic um, footing, that uh, five Nobel laureates actually came and endorsed our center. And I was, uh, we raised, um, succeeded in raising $50 million as a foundation for the center, and we give funds to um, MIT students who want to attend the university and who also have the entrepreneurial potential and the desire to create um, enterprises in poor countries. Um, I will come back, but I would like to describe the philosophy through my own story and uh, also with a historical perspective as to why this is an important um, center, I believe, and, um, and again, of course, you can judge. The point is that the poor countries, as we all know, face headwinds in making economic, social, political progress. And we have all sorts of theories as to what is the headwind, what is blocking them. Um, we hear that the, they have bad leaders, they have uh, lack of resources, all these problems. But I think at the end of the day, it's really concentration of power that holds them back. And, um, and it's the innovations and entrepreneurship that can lead to dispersion of power, which can be the tailwinds. For, for these countries. The idea is, um, it occurred to me over time, I came to America to, I grew up in Bangladesh, I came to America to go to college, and um, 33 years ago. When I came here, and I was, when I was researching about universities in the United States, I discovered that not all good schools are in Washington, D.C. Um, this is because in my country, the best schools are in its capital city. And so from that, I started seeing that the dispersion, which again comes through innovations and entrepreneurship, actually leads to economic, social, political progress. And just to give you an extreme example, North Korea and South Korea, both are culturally same, both actually started with dictatorships. But South Korea, as we know, have moved to democracy, and you can see a picture for electrical use in the evening it's a pretty dispersed activities. In North Korea, there is almost none. It's the electricity, they do have electricity, but it's in a, in a one, concentrated in one town, Pyongyang. So this is an extreme case, but many poor countries actually have this predicament. There's a lot of concentration of facilities, resources, um, power are in one capital city, and the vast areas are generally ignored. And uh, so, if you create an enterprise in a poor country, then you're automatically leading to some dispersion. And, and that's the point I want to explain. But before that, you, again, let me explain why this is the case. And England, as we all know, is the place where democracy and capitalism flourished in the modern world before anywhere else. But they had pretty bad leaders. Let me explain. Let me read from this book. Over the last thousand years or so, many kings and queens of England have played their parts in betrayals, regicides, plots, treasons, atrocities, and revolts. There have been five pretenders to the crown, two of them imposters. Four kings have been forcibly deposed. All were subsequently murdered. One of them publicly executed. Now, poor countries have bad governments, bad leaders, but they still have some ways to go to catch up with the record of where the cradle of capitalism and, uh, and democracy took place. 
And this is not to make fun of England, but to point out that it must be some other force. It is not true that the bad leaders necessarily hold back, but rather the empowerment of citizens through entrepreneurship and innovations can tame the, tame the leaders and give rise to an overall progress. Because England, as, you know, as we all know, had a pretty good record of economic and social progress, despite some of these um, leadership record. So about a thousand years ago, for instance, simple uh, metal plows over, um, over wooden plows allowed people to cultivate more effectively and get, grow more food. Or they had windmills, so water mills, clocks, eyeglasses, all these things empowered people. And they became stronger, and they were able to demand checks and balances from, from their authorities. And, <clears throat> and again, this is not my theory. It's out there in the books. And this is one of the books David Landis, who taught at Harvard for 40 years. And, uh, but if you look at, along with that, what went there, what took place in Europe in general, but England in particular, is there was a devolution of authority. That's, again, governments had to come down from their high horses. And again, com make compromises through which all sorts of progress of, um, ensued. So let me give you one example. Uh, the English parliament. Around 13th century, England, um, the king wanted to tax people to fund his wars or his administration. And by this time, property rights have emerged in England due to certain weaknesses of the king and for also assertions of citizens as to uh, they want to hold on to the money they have made. So when the king wanted to tax citizens, um, citizens said, no, you cannot do that. That's a violation of property rights, which we already have. And the, so the king said, how can I run my administration? How can I wage wars? So the citizen side said, you can if you take our consent. But how can you take consent in a country that's not democratic? So he created a workshop and said that if this workshop people you know, accept a a particular tax proposal, then it will be legitimate. So the parliament, and he called that workshop parliament. So the parliament started as a tax legitimizing device. And soon the parliament realized that each time the king needed new taxes, it could demand something for, because the king needed those taxes. So it could demand something in order to legitimize, and then the king would accept, I mean, the citizens would accept such a tax. So each time the king came for a tax, the parliament said, free that port, reduce that tariff, do this, do that. And this is, the, is an example of how checks and balances emerged in England. And because, again, citizens and um, businessmen, merchants started to make money, and they could make, force the king to accept compromises, which ultimately led to the progress we see in England. So if you see that, then we can see what happens if, we, if mankind advanced enough 500 years ago and created World Bank, for instance, 500 years ago, and funded England, the king, king of England 500 years ago, what would have happened? I think it would, have, it would have set England back. And rather, so the funding to the, the central government of poor countries are often being counterproductive. I'm just trying to illustrate that through the history of the best case of capitalism and democracy. So history of liberty is the history of limitations of government power, not the increase of it. And that's what, what explains at least part of the, reason, part of the uh, explanation that why poor countries are, are not progressing enough. Because aid to governments have often led to the empowerment of governments not limiting them, just the opposite of the nature of progress that we can see in Europe. So governments become responsive to citizens when citizens make economic contributions to government. And this is why entrepreneurs are important. Entrepreneurs create jobs, products, and services, and economically empower citizens. And therefore, entrepreneurs create the tailwinds that poor countries need. 
and even, even just for profit enterprises. That gives rise to social and political progress, as I, as I explained. And so if concentration of power is the problem, what are the dispersions? And as I said, any entrepreneur starting a new business is a form of dispersion. But in the early 90s, I observed an interesting um, dispersive force. It's well known. It's called the Moore's Law, which basically says how many transistors would be jammed into a microchip. And Gordon Moore, who founded um, Intel, he, he observed that the number of transistors go up almost, you know, doubles every 18 months, which sort of translates to the point that the price of microchips, the power of computers fall by, uh, I mean, the price, if you keep the power constant, the price falls by 50% every 18 months. And that means every three years, it goes to a quarter, which also means that every six years, it goes to one over 16. And so every 12 years, it goes to one over 256. So every 15 years, $1,000 worth of microchips become $1. And so this is a, if, if the prices were going down radically, cascading down, so it leads to possibilities that you can harness the power of microchips and allow poor people to be empowered, just like, um, let's say, eyeglasses, windmills, and water mills have helped um, you know, citizens uh, hundreds of years ago. So that, but then how can computers be used by um, people in poor countries where most of people are even illiterate? So that's what led me to this situation where one day I, um, I was, um, my, we, I used to work here in New York in Midtown and um, four or five of us were connected through a computer network. And um, one day it broke and we became productive because we didn't have to exchange floppy disk. Many of you may not know floppy disk, but it existed. Um, and it's, so it became a little bit easier and one day it broke down, and it, um, I, I was waiting for someone to come and fix it. And uh, actually, Bruce has told the story, so I don't have to repeat it. But it reminded me of a day when uh, I, too, for lack of communications, wasted another day in a, in a village in, in a developing country. And so I put these two experiences together. And I say connectivity is productivity. If you enable, if you connect someone, you enable. If you disconnect him, you disable him, at least partially. And so if that's the case, then telephones are a weapon against poverty. And so I started looking at where does Bangladesh stand at that time. And we had only one phone for every 500 people. And uh, the vast rural areas um, where 100 million people lived, there were no phones. And, um, <clears throat> and again, most phones were located in one single city. So the point, I, and I realized that phones are getting cheaper because, as I explained, the microchips were beginning to power telephones as well, not just computers. So the computer's prices are cascading, so would be the phone prices. And if connectivity leads to productivity, then part of that productivity could be used to pay for the services. It's like we, um, you know, if you, if, if, if you don't waste time, if you, just like I was wasting time, other people may be saving time if, um, if they are connected um, with whoever they want to work with. And of course, I am, um, one, one of the problems the poor countries face is this idea that poor countries have very little resources. The more interesting point is the resources they already have are often wasted. So for instance, time is an, is an important resource. A Bangladeshi and an American both have 24 hours a day. The reason Bangladeshis fall behind is that the, the, the time they do have are wasted because they don't have an efficient way of getting things done. And so this is one, an important resource that is wasted. And so I felt that perhaps we can fix that problem if we can connect the country. And then the main problem was, again, is the concentration of resources. Because in the urban center, there were uh, all the facilities were there. In the rural areas, there was very little other things. 
So I was noticing that the internet was booming in this country very rapidly because people already had computers, they had modems, they had telephone lines, um, hardware, software, credit cards, whatever. All these things already existed. A new idea could spread very quickly. But in a poor country, most of these resources are in one city. So in places where you would like to bring the services are precisely where nothing else exists. So it's very hard to bring something new. And that's how I noticed the microcredit organizations. One of them was Grameen Bank, which recently got Nobel Prize. And, uh, <clears throat> and the Grameen Bank had 1,000 branches, 2 million borrowers, and I thought maybe I could somehow bring them into uh, my project and use those branches as a stations to either to put cell towers or customer service, et cetera. But, uh, so I started asking them if they would be interested in being a client because they could manage the branches better. But this wasn't that interesting to them because um, they have been so, sort of decentralized and uh, they had to be. They couldn't manage the uh, you know, um, branches minute by minute so they would get a weekly report um, from the branches. So they were not that interested in it. So I started focusing on what is it, what's the core thing they do. So basically, a woman typically borrows money from the bank and she buys a cow. The cow gives milk, she sells the milk in the village and pays off the loan. And of course, there were other loans. There were goat loans, there were duck loans, chicken loans, vegetable loans. Uh, but the cow loan was most common. So I said, you know, perhaps a cell phone could be a cow because somebody could be borrowing $200 and it could be a business for, um, for her and at the same time it's a phone for a whole community. And historically again, America where phones started was a community-based device. It was not necessarily for individuals initially. So <clears throat> I told this to uh, Grameen Bank and they thought it's a little crazy but it's uh, logical nonetheless. So they said, um, if you think it can be done, make it happen. So I actually created a company here in New York called Gonophone, which means in Bengali, phones for the masses, which was, a lot of people said it was crazy because mobile phones was actually being used by one or two percent of Americans in, in, back in 93, 94. But, and a lot of, I spoke to many, many telephone companies, many, most of them rejected me. Um, because I was not only trying to go to a poor country, I was trying to go to the poor of the poor country. And, um, but nonetheless, I convinced an angel investor, Joshua Millman, he lives uh, Upper West Side here, and he uh, gave me $125,000 that bought me plane tickets to fly around the world and try to convince telephone companies. And it took me several more years, and uh, of course, I got about a million miles on my frequent flyers card, some minor loss of hair, but I eventually managed to convince uh, both Grameen Bank and the Norwegian telephone company to st get together with Gonophone and create a company called Gram and Grameen Phone at the request of Grameen Bank. And so then we, we, go, we applied for a license, Grameen Bank's credibility helped getting the license from the government, and so by 1997 we started a service and we raised money from these partners, and also we got, subsequently in 1999, we got loans from IFC, Asian Development Bank, uh, IFC is International Finance Corporations, et cetera. So together, we had about $125 million, and we started building the network. I was just trying to show you the dispersion of benefits. By 2005, the whole country was covered, and it's by now actually almost $2.5 billion have been invested, all self-generated cash. And uh, 250,000 retailers sell these services in their respective communities. 70,000 villages have access. 22, the Garmin phone itself has 22 million subscribers. Other telephone companies have emerged. And, um, but the, through these 250,000 uh, retailers, it has given access to 100 million people. And the country now has 50 million cell phones, which is 100 times more than the uh, number of phones we had in 93, 94 when I started. And the, country, and the company makes profits. Uh, it gives very serious amount of taxes. Of course, the GDP of a single company, the amount of GDP it has, you know, has raised uh, arguably is more than aid or other major resources that the country receives. Uh, here is uh, in 19, uh, just uh, two months ago, there was a 
cover story in The Economist, which was talking about how cell phones have, have really transformed developing countries. And uh, which is interesting validation of uh, what was my crazy idea 17 years ago. But um, let me uh, point out one important po uh, thing, uh, observation I have on that. That it, there is a 20 page article sometime in September, uh, September 26th. The point is how did all this happen? Billions and billions of dollars worth of investment has gone to developing countries to build the infrastructure because it is providing a productivity tool. Because people become more productive, part of that productivity they can use to pay for the phone service. So if I'm a fisherman, if, if I could save a day and then wasting the day uh, by making a phone call, I could, let's say, catch five fish. So if I sell one fish and pay for the call, I'm still four fish ahead. And at the same time, because I'm willing to pay for the service, the companies can provide a service, and they can make money. And with that money, they make more investments. And that's exactly how all these billions and billions of dollars of the investment has been made in Africa, Latin America, some of the poorest countries in the world. So at the end of the day, it's the increased productivity of people that has led to this, this um, infrastructure, far larger than many, many infrastructure that the large institutions try to create. And this is built up atom by atom by people's increased productivity. So the, there are many notions out there that I just want to point out that at least Grameen Phone shows the truth might be contrary to these notions. That the government needs to provide economically viable services. No, private companies can provide them if they're economically viable ideas. If we can create interesting ideas, new ways of solving problems, then that can be done. You know, economic shortcuts could be made. That is one of the things that Grameen Phone tried to do. Then government must subsidize companies to serve the poor. No, companies pay taxes to the government so the government can focus on governing. Poor countries need aid. No, businesses raise resources far more than aid. The GDP of the country is growing in, instead of 3%, 6% right now. And each percentage point is about a billion dollars. So all these uh, extra productivity is, is actually far more interesting. And plus, it's not in one part which can be embezzled, but rather it's dispersed among the people, which cannot be abused. So rich countries either help or exploit poor countries. No, there could be mutually beneficial relationships. In this case, the Norwegians have not only uh, helped Bangladesh, but Bangladesh is helping Norway. The, Norway the, the value of Grameen Phone, the Norwegian the ownership, the part they own, is worth two, three billion dollars, which is an important part of the Norwegian telephone company. And that's the way it should be. Norway is a country of four and a half million people. Bangladesh is a, hundred, a country of 150 million people. Bangladesh should be able to help Norway. So poor countries are recipients, they are a resource. I mean, poor people are recipients, no, they are a resource. In fact, their involvement have reduces the cost of delivery of a service. So the engaging the people, I think, is the key to, that I'm trying to emphasize on. The uneducated poor cannot do much, that's not true. They're, the people get easily, uh, a, a learn, they learn the process very quickly, Within one or two days, these sometimes even illiterate people are able to provide a service in their community. Something that makes a difference in their lives, people take it seriously and learn. In fact, recently, I'm trying to show you that there is, a, interestingly, a, a global trend in towards entrepreneurship, which is really something to celebrate. They recently, an economist um, is, had a survey on the global um, you know, entrepreneurship as a new force. And um, this, this survey didn't take place before. It's just uh, this summer. And this is the last month, um, or two months ago, the Harvard Business Review, um, and then an article which shows that how innovation, large companies, even like General Electric, uh, are, are being forced to introduce their innovations in developing countries first, and then bring it here Contrary to the way it used to be, that you introduce it here, and then when it gets exhausted, you take it to developing countries. That's because those large companies that will do so will beat the uh, companies that don't, because those products are, are meeting a more, uh, more uh, I would say, a lower purchasing power, and therefore those products are likely to su succeed in the developed countries. For, so, uh, uh, more than for the company that tries that. So in other words, if GE and Siemens 
tried um, a product, if Siemens tried it in India first, it might outcompete GE in, in, in the United States. So that is why we are all need to see that the, the world is changing rapidly and the, the countries what are known to be poor countries are actually potentially interesting places for innovations and might actually improve the whole world. And we, we need to reckon with that. And again, the Legatum Center is precisely on these ideas, is charging ahead. Our fellows are creating all sorts of ideas and innovations so that they can create enterprises in developing countries. And please check our website. Thank you very much.